you're being seated, do you, do you remember what he did for you? Does it ever just hit you and overwhelm you? I want to talk to you about remembering, never forgetting what our God has done. And I want you to pray for us this weekend. I know you guys enter a Mardi Gras season that provides incredible opportunity for ministry and lighting up the darkness. And I want to tell you something. I have long admired this seminary for that reason. It's because you are on the cutting edge. And there are a lot of us who would like to spend our time cursing the darkness, but you're lighting it up. And you've shown us how. Don't ever lose that. Don't ever forget why you're here and where you are. And remembering has a lot to do with that. This weekend, we're going to have our third annual Queen celebration. It's basically a day where we go down on the streets of Orlando, down on the trail, a place called OBT, and we pick up as many prostitutes as we can find. We bring them from women's shelters, from the homeless shelters, from the rescue missions. And we bring them to our campus and we start with a banquet where the men who serve are dressed in black and white. There are ladies at the tables that host them. We bring out our finest stuff and we just try to treat them in every way like a queen. And we have testimonies of those who've been where they are and have found grace in his eyes and been changed by his love. I speak to them. We worship with them. We share the gospel. There's response time. And then they leave by stations and they go into rooms where there will be pedicures, manicures, makeovers, do their hair. There's even uh, hand massages. There's accessories. Last year, the ladies came, got me, and said, David, one of our members brought a purse to do this. When you spoke Sunday about giving your best to these ladies, they brought in a purse that uh, has a tag on it. It's $1,500. We thought you'd want to see this purse. I said, yeah, I'd like to see a $1,500 purse. I would really like to see that. And I went in and looked at it, and I said, why did she do this? What did she say? David, when she dropped it off, she said that she wanted to give her best to these ladies. There are clothes that are unbelievable. Many have never been worn. And so they basically walk out of there with a day of being treated, pampered, and receiving gifts that no price tag on it. Let me quote two of them from a couple of years ago. They walked up to me as they were leaving. They said, Pastor David, we just got to thank you for everything. And said, you know, we've always known there was a big old church down here. It's hard to miss First Baptist Orlando. We knew you guys were here. We just didn't know you cared for whores like us. But we know today. One of those ladies has been back every Sunday. And she's bringing them with her. Would you pray Saturday? The love of Christ shines brightly through the lives of First Baptist Orlando. And you know why we do this? Because we remember. If it weren't for the grace of God. We remember what he did for us. I, every year I ask God to give me a word for the year. And it's, I won't take the time to tell you. There's been some amazing stories that have come out of the word God has given me for the year. And we've asked our people to do it. So we're all on this journey together of about november you know, December saying, God, what, what's the word for the next year? Well, last year, in July, God gave me the word, Remember. And so I began to think about it, and I said, Lord, what, what is it that you want to do with that word? And God's been showing me some most incredible things. In fact, I've got a, this blue band just is, has the word remember on it. And I wear it every day because I want to remember. And I'm going to take you to a text where remembering is a reason to keep singing. It's one of my favorite texts in the Old Testament. It's Psalm 137. As you turn there, of course, it's an exilic psalm. It's, it's basically the story of uh, the exile and waking up one day and you're in a foreign land. 
You no longer have the, uh, the queen city Jerusalem. You don't have the precious jewel called the temple. You're waking up by the rivers of Babylon. And according to the psalm, you're hanging up the harps, you quit singing. But then all of a sudden the thought gets you, but if I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue literally cleave to the roof of my mouth. So let me read with you. Starting in verse 1, Psalm 137. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and we wept. When we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our harps, for there our captors required of us songs. Our tormentors mirth, saying, hey, sing us one of those songs of Zion. How do you sing the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? But if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. This is a graphic psalm. Every time I read this psalm, I know people read on verse 7, 8, and 9. It is for that reason that the Anglican Church in 1980 removed it from the liturgy. Said you don't have to read this psalm as a part of the readings. Why? Because it's graphic. It's emotional. It's gut-wrenching. Because here's some observations. Number one, sooner or later, every one of us will wake up in a foreign land. Sooner or later, everybody is going to wake up and your world is not the same. And you don't have to move locations to wake up in a foreign land. I had a dear friend of mine, graduated from me from Ouachita. When he, uh, in fact, we served together. We were roommates in college, and we served together in the little church I pastored in Murfreesboro, Arkansas, my first church. And when I went to Southwestern Seminary, he went to Louisville. And so he met a young lady married. I married, and, and so we're going to get together when he comes back uh, for Christmas. And that Christmas, I remember just the excitement of being able to see him again and with his wife. And so my wife and I were driving from Fort Worth. They were driving from Louisville back to a place called Searcy, Arkansas, right above Little Rock. When he and his wife were coming through Nashville, they got on I-40 and they're headed across over uh, to uh, Memphis. She got sleepy driving and she pulled the van over. And uh, when, when she pulled it over, she didn't get it all the way off the road. And an 18-wheeler hit it from behind and immediately exploded. And he was able to get out and he tried to get her out. But the fire consumed her. I'll never forget the worst, first words that he told me when I saw him. I grabbed him. He's weeping and I'm weeping. And this is what he said. David, life really is fair. Because sooner or later it breaks everybody's heart. I've never forgotten those words. I woke up in a foreign land this year. It's the first time in my life I haven't had my dad on this earth. I said goodbye to him on April the 15th. In August, I said goodbye to the second godliest man I've ever known. That's my father-in-law. A doctor, an MD from Eldorado, Arkansas, in, fact, in practice for over 50 years. He is the godliest man I've ever known. And the two men that have impacted my life the most are gone. And I'll never forget that first morning I woke up and thought, my dad's not here. He's not here. You see, a foreign land is just anything that's different. It's when your career, you know, it's when your uh, life's not going the way you thought. Classes aren't working out the way you thought. A relationship doesn't go the way you want it to. A ministry at a church, you know, you thought it was going to be great, and it has really gone south, and it's a foreign land now. You don't want to be there. And the truth of it is, every one of us are going to get there sooner or later. Your world's going to change. Your world is going to be different. When I was pastoring in Camden, Arkansas, I had a great worship leader named Rob Wright. And Rob actually was interim, and, but he was such a great guy. And I loved watching him and listening and, and leading, uh, singing with him as he led us. They had their first child. It was a boy the same age as our first child. They were coming to the birth of their second child. We went to the hospital. It was a, one of those moments we were all excited about. 
And the baby's born, and it's a little girl named Emily, and, and so we're celebrating, and, and it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't 30 minutes. The doctor came back in and said, uh, we're going to run some tests. Uh, we've noticed some things. We need to make sure everything's okay. So you guys, we'll be back in in just a little bit. Well, you can imagine, that kind of changed the party atmosphere just a little bit. And then about 15, 20 minutes later, he walked in and he said, uh, we've confirmed it. Your daughter has Down syndrome. And I'll never get, forget that moment. When you go from celebrating new life, rejoicing, to all of a sudden a world that's going to be very different. And one day I asked Rob, I said, Rob, I want to know something. How is it that you get up there and lead worship? And, and it doesn't even look like it's phased you what you've gone through. Because Emily turned out, and I saw her not long ago, she's the most precious gift that you can imagine, full of life, full of joy. But I said, Rob, how do you do it? And, and he, he told me a story. He said, David, this will help. It actually appeared in Dear Abby. It's a story of a couple. It's in a parable form. A couple's planning to go to Italy. They're buying books about Italy. They're learning Italian. They're getting ready. They're packed. They're ready to go. They get on the plane, and the flight over is wonderful. Only to hear the attendants say, Welcome to Holland. And the couple says, Wait, we, that's not where we signed up to go. Well, you're in Holland. But we didn't want to go to Holland. We don't know anything about Holland. Well, you're here. Hope you enjoy Holland. And so you get off the plane. And you're mad. Because this is not what you planned. This is not where you wanted to go. There's nothing about this that's fair or right. And then you realize Holland has tulips. Holland has Rembrandts. Holland's okay. But the rest of your life, you'll wonder what it was like in Italy. He said, David, that's how it feels. You know what? Sooner or later, that's life. And it can be a doctor's report. It can be one exam. I used to teach our kids when they were little, when you hear an ambulance, pray because somebody's world just changed. We're that close. So sooner or later, we are all going to wake up in a foreign land. Second thing, not all foreign lands are bad. You see, I don't think that for some of you, the challenge is going to be the foreign land that where you have bad things happening and everything's wrong. No. Some of you are going to do very well. Your ministry is going to be blessed. You're going to prosper. But let me tell you, the danger is just as real for you to forget as it is for those who wake up in a very bad foreign land. In fact, that's why Moses, in one of those sermons of Deuteronomy, preparing the people to go in to the promised land, looks at them. And in the eighth chapter, he says, when you get in that promised land and your herds multiply and your flocks increase and things are great, you build wonderful houses, don't forget the Lord your God. I'm convinced there's some of us, when times are good, we forget where it came from. And one of the things that I've seen that is systemic in our convention is a sense of pride thinking we got here on our own. We did this ourselves. Look at the ministry I built. Look at the building I built. Let me just remind you, you didn't build anything. You didn't do anything. It was the grace of God. Remember Jerusalem. Even when that foreign land is good. The third observation. Unfortunately, the first thing that goes in a foreign land is your song. They quit singing. They hung up the harp, sat down by the river and wept. Tormentor said, hey, sing us one of those songs of the Lord. And the answer, how do you sing when you're in a foreign land? How do you sing when things aren't going the way you want them to? How do you sing when God is silent? He's not answering your prayer. When what you thought was obedience on your part, and you've done everything you know to do, and it's just not working the way you want it to. How do you sing? That's a great question. Let me tell you why. 
you've got to ask that question because God put a song in you the day you were born. He created a heart of worship in you. And he gave you a song to sing and the world takes our song away. And the land that changes those circumstances of our life, the tragedies of our life, have a way of stealing that song. And so the psalmist question, how do you sing the songs of the Lord, is one that I will challenge you the rest of your days. Get the answer to this one. Because you're going to get mad at God. There's going to be bitterness. Warren Wiersbe said it's the number one issue in ministry today. Bitterness. But we don't take it out on God. We don't express it in our disappointment with God. We express it in the pulpit as we beat up people every Sunday. Because we're angry inside. You see, hurting people hurt people. And some of us know better than to mess with him, so we hurt people. But sometimes it is a bitterness toward God that just changes your song. Oh, you still worship. You still sing the songs. They just don't mean what they once did. You don't find yourself being lost in the wonder of his salvation. You just don't ever stop and think about the cross and wonder, how could he love me that much? Why? Because God didn't do something the way you wanted to. That's a foreign land. It takes your song. And yet there's a part of me that looks at history and says, God, they sang. There's a part of me that looks at what's going on in our world and, and they sang. Let me tell you what I'm referring to. Go back and read the stories of martyrs. Even to today, some people forget the persecuted church. Let me tell you how many die for Jesus every year. They could populate Fort Lauderdale. They could populate Tallahassee. Every year, that's how many Christians die for Jesus. And here's an amazing thing. Go back in history, all the way back to those early martyrs. Look at how many of them died singing. They died singing. Their last voice. I mean, as they're dying for him, they are praising him with their last breath. We had a, a mission team in Haiti when the earthquake hit. And uh, we were very privileged to have some students and some adults. One of the adults was uh, 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 the guy who did the main uh, videography work for uh, Facing the Giants and then also for uh, Fireproof. He is with NFL Films. He's the one that shoots a lot of that footage you see in some of those uh, NFL film things. He had his camera down there, and he is documenting this mission trip. And, and, and it's unbelievable what happens. In fact, Larry King bought the footage. CNN has, has paid a big price for his footage. He is on a beach, and he's interviewing one of our girls. And, and, and all of a sudden, behind him, you hear the most horrible sound, and it looks like the earth is literally a wave. It's, it's unbelievable what this video shows in just a matter of seconds. And then the camera falls, and everything goes black. Bob. The cameraman wrote his wife that night an email. I have it. I've carried it with me. I've kept it ever since she let me have it. They took our kids and they took 44 inland because they thought a tsunami was next. They didn't know. They thought, man, if that earthquake was that big, there's a tsunami coming. Get away from the coast. So they go inland. They find a school that they can circle up their vehicles in a circle. And they put all the students inside the, the vehicles. Well, Bob is just, he is so overwhelmed at what's happening. He is walking around that night in some of the streets. And he said to his wife, honey, they're everywhere. They're in every street. None of them will go in buildings. They won't go in homes because of fear of the buildings falling. They're in the streets. And then he said this. And honey, you're not going to believe what they're doing. They're singing. They're worshiping. She said, he said, I heard a man in a field by himself, and I looked, and the best I could see was the silhouette of a man on his knees with his hands lifted. And all he was saying was, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Guys, these people had nothing. And now what nothing they had is gone. And they're going to sing? They're going to on their knees in a field worship and say hallelujah? How do you sing the songs of the Lord when your world changes? You remember. 
The answer to the psalmist's question is simple. Remember Jerusalem. And the way the psalmist said, he does it in such a graphic way. He says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. That is the equivalent of saying, may I have a stroke and not be able to use my body for anything at all if I'm not going to use it to bring you praise and glory. Then he says, and let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. What is that? It is a Hebrew way of saying, may I go dumb. If my mouth is not going to be used to praise you, may I never use it for anything at all. If I forget you, Jerusalem. So, how are you going to sing? You're going to remember. You're going to remember your Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem for them meant something very different than it does for us. I don't believe it violates the text. Let me just lift it out, set it down in front of where we are. Your Jerusalem is moments you've had with God. The day he called you. The day he saved you. It's times when you've seen him answer your prayers. It's times when you have felt his presence. It is times when you have worshipped him and God has been so near. Your Jerusalem is simply the presence of God in your life through the days gone by. Remember, don't ever forget what he did for you. And you know what that does? When you remember what he's done for you, it makes you sing. You know why? Because here's worship. Our people don't understand worship. You need to help them get this. You don't worship God because life is good. You worship God because he is good. You remember. And therefore, when you remember him, you worship him, even in a foreign land. So when I remember him, I think back of those moments in my life, the day he called me in ministry, the day that he gave me my wife, the the day that he saved me, all of those things. I, I remember last week something that God did in my life. I won't forget it. I remember it. In fact, if you want to do a little interesting study, go back in the Scripture and look at all the ways God gave his people to remember things. Why do you think they pile stones up? And by the way, when you come, if you come to Orlando in the next year, you'll see a pile of rocks out at our main entrance. And every one of those rocks has something written on it because all year long, our people, when God answers a prayer, when they have a baby, when somebody gets a job, when something God does, they write it on a rock and they place it on a pile. And behind that pile of rocks is one big sign that says, remember. Because I'm convinced that if we were to remember, why did the festivals and feasts, why were they given to Israel? To remember. Why do we do the Lord's Supper? To remember. Why do we sing these great songs of the faith? To remember. And you know what I've decided? If God never blesses me another day of my life, I remember enough blessings that I will sing for him the rest of my days. He has already done enough. And I know that God is good. So I worship him, I sing. And that sense of remembrance gives me hope for the future. When David went to fight Goliath, it's a great line. When David went to fight Goliath, you remember the story? They look at him like, what are you doing here? He was really bringing lunch, but I mean, he's going to fight a giant. What are you doing? I want to fight this giant. Obviously, this is paraphrase. And so they said, what makes you think you, a shepherd boy, can fight this giant? And, And listen to what David said. My God delivered me from the paw of the lion. He delivered me from the paw of the bear. And I am persuaded today He can deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. The hope of David beating that giant was based on what he remembered that God had already done. Remember Jerusalem. And then there is that phrase, remember Jerusalem as your highest joy, above your highest joy. It's a very interesting construction in the Hebrew, and I love it, and there's a lot of angles. Let me just paint it for you this way. When you remember your God in the moments you've had as your highest joy, or if you choose the translation, above your highest joy, you basically have said, God, you alone will I worship. 
You alone will be the one that captured my heart, and I will sing to you. Worship is by very definition giving worth to something. It is placing on the highest place, in the highest place, something that matters most to you. And so when you remember him, you give him the highest place, and you sing, and you worship him. Because when you do, amazing things happen. You know, I believe worship is the greatest way to fight a spiritual war that God has given us. It's, it's, it's a weapon. And I remember meeting this lady. lady she came to our, our church in West Monroe. She came to see me one day, and she said, David, I just need to come tell you my story. I know you don't see me. I sit in the back of the church. And I said, well, tell me about it. And she said, I, uh, I've been coming for a while. And she said, something real amazing has happened here. She said, you really like worship, don't you? And I said, well, yeah, I really do. And she said, well, let me tell you what it's, what's happened to me. She said, I got into a bad marriage and had two children, and, and he left me. And I just told God I wasn't marrying again until it was the right one. And, and I just made commitments, and I found this guy. We started dating. Uh, he came to church with me. He was wonderful. And we got married, and he, and he said, you know, I want to pray with the kids every night. So he did. He would go upstairs and pray with them. And one night after a year or so of marriage, he says to her, hey, honey, go on to bed. I'm going to go upstairs. I'm going to read a Bible story to the kids and pray with them, and just like he had done every night. She said, that's great. I'll, I'll be in bed. And so she said, I'm lying there, and I'm, I'm, she said, I'm kind of dreaming. I'm kind of asleep, and I'm just thanking God for my marriage and my home. The next thing she feels... She said, I felt somebody on top of me, and they were beating me with their fist, hitting me in the face. And it so startled me. She said, I thought somebody broke in the front door and got in the bedroom, and, and, and they, you know, they're attacking me. And she said, I wiped the blood away, and I saw him, my husband. And I mean, he is just pounding on her with his fist. And, and all of a sudden, the door opens to the bedroom, and the little boy, her little boy had heard this. And he's standing there with a baseball bat. And he said, Mom, I've come to help you. And so when the guy turns and sees this kid with the bat, it gave her just enough window to get out from under him. She said, David, I ran into the street. I couldn't see. Blood was everywhere. And she said, I ran into a neighbor's house. And they took me in. We called the police. The guy's arrested. He's serving time. But this is, this is what I need you to hear. She said, look at my face. She was a very beautiful lady. I couldn't see any scars. She said, you see my face? You see any scars? I said, no. She said, I've had 17 surgeries to fix what he did to my face. And she said, they're pretty good, aren't they? Doctors are good. You, they fixed it. She said, David, they can't fix what he did to me in here. The scars that he left in here, they can't fix. But she said, I found someone who could. And she said, you know how I found it? I came to church here one Sunday because I'd heard about it. And I stood in the back of the room. She said, I did not open my mouth. But when people began to worship, and I began to sense God's presence, she said, as people worshiped, it felt like an oil was being poured from the top of my head all down my body. And she said, I came back the next Sunday, same thing. As the worship began, I felt his healing coming over my body. And she said, David, the only thing that could heal me in here is worship. You're looking at a whole woman because of worship. So no matter what land you wake up in one day, remember, sing those songs. Oh, I wish you would have the greatest ministries and the most pleasant circumstances. I wish I could save you from deacons meetings along the way, board meetings. I look at you and, and you're young and you're the best and the brightest we've got and I'm so impressed with what I've seen on this campus here in this visit. And I wish I could protect you. But I can't. I can tell you what I pray for. Spud Webb was always one of my heroes. Spud Webb was five feet, six inches tall. Played in the NBA. Did the unthinkable. Nobody said he'd do it. He did it. And not only that, in 1986, he won the slam dunk competition. I got it recorded. It's on a VHS tape somewhere. I mean, I loved Spud Webb. Some, some people don't know Spud's a believer. 
They interviewed him after that. I remember he's 5'6 now, and he just won the NBA slam dunk. I got to see him in Dallas once when I was in seminary, went over to one of his all-star games, and it was just one of those great memories. Spud Webb was being interviewed, and he said, you know, as a kid, I prayed God would make me bigger. And he said, every day I'd pray, God, give me another inch. Give me another inch. Make me bigger. And I'd stand in front of the mirror, and I wasn't any bigger. And he said, when I got in high school, I kept praying it. When I got in college, I kept praying it. And he said, finally one day, I realized God's not going to make me bigger. And he said, I changed my prayer. He said, I, I said, God, if you're not going to make me bigger on the outside, make me bigger on the inside. And God did. You know what my prayer for you is? It's not about the outside. I don't know what you're going to go through in life. My prayer is God makes you big on the inside and that you remember. You remember. Let me close by telling you about my friend Ashley. I carry a picture of Ashley, actually, because her mom told me the day I baptized uh, her mom, she wanted me to tell Ashley's story everywhere I went. When I met Ashley, she was 16 years old. I was at the hospital in West Monroe, Louisiana, visiting some folks there in Monroe, actually. And as I was leaving the hospital, this mom comes up and said, my daughter's here in the hospital. Would you, come, would, would you come up and see her? She watches you every Sunday. She thinks you're wonderful. I said, well, absolutely, I'll go. Let's go. We get on the elevator. I said, tell me what's going on. Well, she's a softball player at West Monroe High School. She was throwing a ball and, uh, and felt her shoulder kind of pull, and we thought she had pulled a muscle. They ran tests, and they found a tumor. And they really believe that it's bone cancer. And it's going to be a pretty, pretty big fight. I said, thanks for telling me that. I walk in the room. When I open the door, this beautiful, blonde-headed, 16-year-old girl lights up and goes, I can't believe it's you. And I looked at her and I said, I can't believe it's you. She said, you don't even know me. I said, yeah, I do. No, your name is Ashley. I know you love to play softball, and I know you watch services every Sunday. And I also know there's something going on in your body, and you're going to be in a battle. And you're going to need somebody to fight with you, so I'm here to fight with you. And I sat down on the side of her bed, and I said, tell me about it. We started talking. She told me about her faith in the Lord. She was a believer. Just, just wasn't involved in church, didn't, didn't have a connection. I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Ashley. I'm going to make a deal with you. We're going to fight this together. But you're going to quit watching the services. You're going to turn that television off, and you're going to come. And we're going to walk with you. And you know what? She did. She got involved. She started doing everything, Bible school, everything we did. She lost her hair twice. When she was 17 years old, she was bald-headed. And I told her one time, you're the most beautiful bald-headed 17-year-old girl I've ever seen. I said, Ashley, only you could look that way. They took the tumor. They took muscle, ligaments, everything. Her left arm was immovable for three years. It came Valentine's Day, 2004. The day before Valentine's Day, her mother called me and said, David, I don't think she has much longer. And I said, well, let me come and uh, let me have one more time with her. And like I'd done so many times, I walked in that room. And as I walked in the room, the mother called me and stopped me. And she said, David, they don't want her to talk. She's, her lungs are filled with fluid and the tumors have filled her lungs. And they've got her on an oxygen mask. And she's going to try to talk, but, but they don't want her to talk. And I said, I and sure enough, she's over there pulling that mask down. And she's saying, David, David. And I just said, no. My time to talk. I sat down by her and I looked at her and said, Ashley, I never saw you hit a home run. Never saw you hit a three-point shot to win a game or, or catch a touchdown pass, but you're my hero because you've taught me how to live. And I want to thank you. And we just both cried together, and again, she's pulling on that mask and trying to talk. Her hair, when it, her hair would come back, it would come back real curly. And it was beautiful, actually, but it was just real curly. And there she was, laying against that pillow, and it was ringing wet with sweat. Just, just, she's just, her body is just so tired. I told her goodbye. As I walked out of the room, she pulled the mask down one more time. She said, thank you. Thank you, David. I got out of that room. I didn't cry in there. I was doing great. 
When I walked in the hall, y'all, I fell in the floor and cried like a baby. In 33 years of doing this, there's one thing I've never gotten good at. And that's saying goodbye. Can't get good at that. The next day was her last day. I got to tell you how she's spinning. Her mom's got a cot right beside her. That morning early, Ashley awakened her with this sound. She couldn't figure out what it was. Mask is still on. Her breathing, let me show you what her breathing was like. It was just so shallow, so fast. I heard that myself. Well, the next morning it was the same way. But she was doing something. So the mother gets up and she leans over and she recognizes Ashley singing. And she's singing a hymn from the Sunday. She had watched the service on Sunday. She's singing one of those hymns. And so the mom thinks, I'll join her and start singing with her. And it's so typical, Ashley. She put her hand up and she goes, my song. All day long. Chorus after chorus after hymn after hymn. All day. She's got that much breath. She's singing. At 11 o'clock that night, she sits up in bed all of a sudden, stops singing. Everybody in the room, <coughs> they didn't know what she was fixing to do. She took her left arm. She hadn't moved it in three years, and she did this. Mom, I'm free. I'm free. And she laid back down, and she looked up in the corner where the wall meets the ceiling of the room, and she said, it's so beautiful. And then she went back to singing. And closed her eyes. And was gone. I got a question for you. You got one day left on this earth. You got that much breath. You're going to sing? How did Ashley sing? One word. Remember. She remembered. May God help us to do the same. I want you to bow with me right now. Greg, we're not going to sing. As your head's bowed right now, I don't know if you're one who has quit singing. Your worship is just going through the motions right now. Songs don't mean what they used to. The scripture doesn't mean what it used to. Why? Because you're in a foreign land. You're in a time that's not really good. A place you never wanted to go. And I wonder if today God just so impressed upon me to talk about this because he knew you'd be here. He knew it's time for you to sing again. So I'm going to pray right now for anyone in this room that's been through some tough days and it's taken your song. 